for this happy prayer. Um, dear Lord, just thank you for uh, this wonderful day, and uh, um, thank you for all the weather we've had, even though it's been uh, hard for some of us. And uh, just thank you for bringing the, the law school here tonight um, to tell us about um, some opportunities that we can have in the future. And just keep us uh, moving through the semester um, and honor you with us in your name. Amen. Uh, so tonight, um, I have a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, this is one of our last meetings. We're getting to the end of um, the year um, with the County Society. Um, but next week, we're going to have uh, Katie Maston from Ernst Ernst & Young uh, come here and talk. Um, same time, same place. And, um, and also that Saturday, so this is next Saturday, it's our end of the year County Society party, which will be at Dr. Solovis Ranch. So that'll be exciting. Yeah. Um, never been there before, but I am um, excited to go. Um, but um, before we begin and introduce uh, Professor Crispin, um, Professor Stowe has a... Uh, just a quick note about next week. Um, Katie Masson from Mercy will be accepting resumes for fall full-time positions and for winter internships for the next year. So keep that in mind. Um, all right. So first of all, I want to, with this being one of our last meetings, I want to just stop and thank our officers from the 2013-2014 year. You guys know we were talking about getting our new officers set for next year. But first and foremost, I want to thank those that have served us this year and done a great job. So, Daniel Keefe, our president. <laughs> Jessica Hampton, who is our vice president. <laughs> Alyssa Hicks, who is our secretary. <laughs> Becca Kirst, who is our treasurer. and we picked our officers for next year. So I would like to present those to you tonight and just kind of get a little bit of approval. I don't guess we have any formal process for that approval, um, but we are pleased to present our officers. So Daniel Kalana will be our president. <laughs> Andrew Hassler will be our vice president. <laughs> Drew Miles will be our treasurer. Our secretary, <laughs> Hannah Vernon will be our tutor, tutoring coordinator. <laughs> we thank them for their commitment to serve, and we're excited about a good year next year. Um, so I guess if there is no comments or questions on that process, we will move on to introduce um, Professor Christman. Thank him so much for coming, and telling us a little bit more about the law school. <laughs> Having me, I certainly appreciate that. I'm an accounting undergrad major, so that's what my undergrad was in, and um, it is a fantastic degree for law school. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But um, I, I wanted to go to law school. I, I thought when I was a little kid, um, actually I had, I had four kind of four things I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, be a professional football player, <laughs> and um, um, you know, I'm six foot nothing. Um, I don't actually run fast for my size. You know, I need to really run really, really fast. I don't run very fast. I don't jump very high. <laughs> so I, I really had no qualifications to be a, a football player. And I grew up sometime in you know, early high school. Otherwise, that was not going to work um, as a career. I wanted to be a Jedi Knight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try to do the, you know, the, the force thing. I never could get anything to come to me. Um, couldn't find anybody to train me. Um, never, you know, found a last leg or anything like that. That didn't work. Um, I wanted to be a pirate. I thought as well. Um, you know, would be an elegant, uh, you know, an exciting life? Um, then you sort of the whole raping and pillaging and stealing and stuff. So you don't think that's not going to work? Um, and I was like, well, there, there, there apparently are opportunities in pirating. Now I didn't know that, but you know, there's there's a substantial number of pirates in 
um, operating around Africa. Um, and then it was, uh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have given up. <laughs> but uh, the, the, then the fourth one was lawyer. So I sort of knew as a, as a little kid I wanted to be a lawyer. That's what I was interested in doing. When I, I started looking at undergrad degrees, I really had the idea of I want to get something that will facilitate me doing well in law school. I really didn't have an idea of I'm going to get something that, that will be uh, uh, sort of a fallback degree or anything like that. I knew I wanted to go to law school. Nobody in my family ever went to college. Um, in fact, I, I mean, probably half and half of graduating high school. I grew up in eastern Kentucky, a pretty impoverished area. That's, that's the accent. Um, uh, but uh, so I had a mentor of mine who actually just recently passed away. But he uh, he was chief of Kentucky State Police. He was the president of the or, I'm sorry. He was the dean of the uh, law enforcement school at Eastern Kentucky University. He had a PhD, and uh, because of being chief of Kentucky State Police was so stressful, he moved out in the middle of nowhere uh, on the side of my grandfather's farm. My grandfather had to finish uh, sixth grade. And, uh, so he would uh, come home from being chief of Kentucky State Police as soon as he could get there, change his clothes, and run over and see what my grandfather was doing in the farm, the farm that he could get into. They became good friends. My grandfather died uh, when I was 10, and he sort of, in some ways, became a substitute grandfather for at least some of us grandkids. Um, and it's, it's funny how God providentially does stuff like that, but he had an absolutely huge impact on my life. He wanted me to go to medical school really bad, um, because he said people always get sick and always need doctors. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great career. I've got just the slightest bit of trim when I try to, um, if I were to spoon sugar in the coffee cup, it's just a little bit of trim. I would have been the scariest doctor in the world. Can you imagine? I had LASIK surgery, you know, and the guy had to peel my, you know, cut into my, my film over my eye and peel that up. Can you imagine? Be doing that. I'm gonna just do the part of it. You know, don't worry. Um, but you know, anyway, I finally told him I said, "That's I can't be. I want to. I want to go law school." All right, if your heart's set on that, I'm gonna go talk to. I know a bunch of people here who are lawyers. I've got lots of friends who are lawyers. I'm gonna go talk to them and see what you want to get as an undergrad major. And he came back and told me accounting. And I have to admit, my first reaction was. <laughs> I respect him too much for the show on my face, so I'm sure I made a very appropriate, awful face. But I mean, I'll get someone's like, you know, I'm going to think of that. Why is that? He said that every lawyer he talked to said that would be the best degree to prepare you for law school. And I tell everybody who comes to me prior to undergrad and says, I want to go to law school, I tell them you need to get an accounting or finance major. They're the two best majors. To prepare you for law school. It causes you to do systematic, careful thinking. Uh, it's very rigorous. Law school is enormously rigorous, so it's very rigorous. Fantastic major to, to prepare you for that. I, I liked it so well once I started doing it. I remember telling my auditing professor, you know, they almost persuaded me to be an accountant. I, I could nearly uh, decide to go be an accountant. Uh, but I ended up going on to law school, and, and I don't, I don't regret that I had at all. Law school is a, now you're going to hear, I mean, obviously going to work for Ernst and Young or a big public accounting firm, going in house somewhere. Those are going to be fantastic opportunities, a great thing to do, um, something great to do with your, with your accounting degrees. What else to go to law school? Uh, law school fits really hand in glove with the type of work that, that you would do as an accountant. Uh, they're, they're closely related to one another. Uh, it's great for advancement in the business world. Um, if you look at CEOs of companies, uh, huge numbers of CEOs of companies, CFOs of companies, you're going to find accountants and lawyers filling that up and offering those degrees together. Uh, so it, it's fantastic for a career. Um, it, it's also fantastic just for the opportunity you have to make a huge impact uh, uh, for Christ. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of um, a story to try to illustrate that. Um, this used to be a better, I don't know how this question will go. Um, because Phil Fisher has been here, but um, who owns VeggieTales? Who created VeggieTales? Surely some of you. How old are you all? Did you watch VeggieTales when you were little? Or no? Some of you had to. Yeah, okay, you did. Because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm getting older enough now. You know, it, 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 there's bound to be. So you watch Veggie Tales when you're little, right? Who created Veggie Tales? Bill Fisher. Yes, big idea. Big idea of productions, right? Saturday morning, uh, Sunday morning value, Saturday morning value. 
we think that's a big idea, right? That's their, their little phrase. So Phil Vischer and Mike Naraki, right? Oh, yeah. I can, that's the one thing I can draw, actually, this model in the area. I bet I'm the only person going to draw anything for you. In the law school, you got that to look forward to. I'm an exceptional artist. That's my truth. But here we go. Oh, eyes a little square. Anyway, so. So I'm multi talented. Um, <laughs> See me draw anything. I'm out draw stick figures and stuff. This is these are the guys. These guys are the best. That's because I've got eight kids, and sometimes they can be entertained by drawing as the vegetables characters. So I, I perfected this one drawing. But um, uh, yeah, this is Phil Fisher. Yeah. They uh, we got two law school babies. So we got two uh, babies born in law school. One born my first semester. I think I said in the finals. <laughs> And that was the extent of the planning. We said, well, we'll just wait till law school to have kids. We, we didn't make any other planning. So when you don't make any other planning, then you have two kids born in law school. Um, so I had, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who is a Catholic and works for ACLJ. He had two kids born in law school. I had two kids born at law school. And at UK's law school, the whole time we were there, there was one other child out there. So we, there were five kids born, and it was almost all us. That is not the number of kids born at the Liberty University School of Law. <laughs> because we have a bunch of uh, students, you know, that get married, are married, have kids. It's kind of a different worldview. But yes, yeah, so we got um, They range in age from uh, 15 to uh, five months. We've got three girls to three boys and two girls. Uh, yeah, so you learn to draw stuff like this because it keeps little folks like that occupied. Um, but Mike Naraki is the voice for um, uh, for Larry the Cucumber. Phil Vischer, the voice for um, Bob the Tomato. You didn't, probably didn't realize it when you were a little kid, but these guys are an example, or at least Phil Vischer and Mike Naraki, example of real excellence among Christians. I sometimes harp on the fact that Christians have... We, we Sometimes we say that if it's Christian, it ought to be better, and we almost cliche that. We don't really mean that. We mean something like, um, if, if it's Christian, it's good enough for us. We'll be good enough, you know, I'm going to be good enough to be a Christian accountant. I don't have to really be an excellent accountant. I'll just be good enough at that. Or good enough to be a Christian attorney. Or good enough to be a Christian musician. Rather than trying to be really excellent, Mike Garaki and Phil Fisher, when they founded this company, were really, really cutting edge. They made real advancements in CGI. Um, advancements that were good enough that it got the attention of people who worked at Pixar and Disney and Warner Brothers. They had people leaving those companies to come and work for them because what they were doing was so cutting edge in the way, for instance, that they make, make the, you know, the vegetables hop around and all that stuff. Um, Phil Vischer had a big dream for that company. Do you remember when he came and spoke here? Yeah. So do you know who, who, who owns vegetables right now? Him? No, you probably think that. The question begs that it's not him, does it not? So he had a big dream that he made that he was going to be the Christian version of Walt Disney. Um, he, uh, and, and he really, it's amazing how successful they actually were. They had at one point eight out of the ten top videos on, on the home video list in the, in the Christian category. It was pretty much dominant. Um, they sold multiple million copies of these, of these VHSs and DVDs. Um, they had at 1.3,300% revenue growth. I mean, it's astounding what this company did. They you know, produced Jonah out of that and things like that. And they went bankrupt. They went bankrupt. The company was sold in bankruptcy to um, a company called Classic Media. It owns uh, the Long Ranger, um, Sherman, Mr. Peabody. Uh, I don't read off the red nose or reindeer, you know, the little uh, Christmas things you watch like uh, Cross the Snowman and the little claymation Santa Clauses and stuff like that. Uh, that company was later then sold to Entertainment Rights. It was later bought back by a private equity group. Entertainment Rights is a big kind of British company. It is now owned by DreamWorks Animation Studios. So DreamWorks, no special friend of Christianity, that's for sure. You can look that up on the internet and see what you'll find there. Um, but uh, so that company, his dream to be the Christian Walt Disney, 
um, uh, Saturday, which involved combating what he saw as what the, the big four entertainment companies were doing. He talks about, for instance, how they, their plan was to walk kids through Nick Jr. into Nickelodeon, into MTV, and on down the road. If you don't know that, the, the entertainment industry is quite a bit vertically integrated. Um, in, in terms of age, they want to get you watching uh, Disney, uh, uh, what is it, what is it, Disney, it's not, it's Nick Jr. and Disney. Yeah, it's Big Mouse Clubhouse. It's part of it. Um, it's the young, 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 young Disney Playhouse. There's two Disney. And there's. It's not. No, I actually think it's Disney Junior. Is it Disney Junior too? Yeah. So it's Nick Junior and Disney Junior. It's Disney so, Junior. Okay. They were already the age of seven. Disney Junior. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have cable, so then I struggle to know sometimes the the stuff. You know what 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 those are. We have Netflix and stuff on the. Super weird. Well, I probably am super weird. <laughs> not super weird is that if you think not having any television in the house is super weird, you have television, you just don't have it on the cable. But uh, uh, so they want to move you through that, through to, through to normal Disney, through to kind of the, you know, what used to be Hannah Montana, that, those types of shows, and then on into, because of course, because of course Disney owns ABC, Disney owns ESPN. They're, they're very vertically integrated in terms of age. They want to run you all the way through their material. And so Phil Vischer looked and he said, these companies aren't evil, they're not immoral. He said, they're just amoral. What they care about is what makes money. And they don't care about anything else. So they're not gonna care about what they're actually teaching. They're not gonna care about what the kids, you know, actually are, are learning, things like that. They just care about how can we make money. She said, I wanna come back with uh, I wanna come back that with, with Sunday morning values and Saturday morning fun, right? And Disney does, in fact, they're brilliant about it. Uh, Disney, you probably know, just bought Lucas Films not too long ago. They also bought uh, Marvel. Why did they do those things? Because they realized that they did not have, um, they couldn't get young boys. Young boys didn't like their programming. And so they went out and got Marvel and got Lucas Films in order to, to get young boys. They do really well with young girls, they weren't doing well with young boys. So they're brilliant how they do it. Phil Vischer says, I want to, we want to combat that. And he, he sort of had his BHAG, that was his you know, big area of skull. He was going to build a top four entertainment company that would be Christian. He wanted to be like Walt Disney. So he's got a dream to do something really awesome. He's got the ability to do it. So it's, you know, he, he's not. I mean, he, he is cutting edge in what he's doing here, and he ends up with his company in bankruptcy. Now, why is that? I'm sure he'll tell you because God's in control and God brought him through all that. We can also look at sort of practical steps down the way, right? I mean, and, and, and some of those steps involve the fact that he uh, that he really got bad legal and business advice. Now, when I in my law practice, and that's what my teaching really is focused on law school as well, my law practice focused on representing small businesses and their owners. A competent small business attorney representing small businesses and their owners could have saved veggie tails from the fate that ended up being. One example, for instance, is, let me give you a couple. This is a great book. Um, I took the cover off of it, and it's pretty well worn, but this is his book, Me, Myself, and Bob. It's a, it's a fantastic book for anybody who, if you, if you don't go, if you don't, if you don't go to law school, you got to get this book and read it. Why should you do that? Because as an accountant, you're going to represent probably and deal with small businesses. You're going to probably deal with startups. And this book will give you an idea of how much they love their companies and how much their life is invested in their companies and tied up in it. And if you don't understand how much they love their companies and how much their life is invested and tied up in it, you're not going to be a very good lawyer for them. You're not going to be a very good accountant for them because you're not going to understand how important it is to them. God has given them dreams, abilities, opportunities, and you can help them shepherd that. Uh, and they need that in the times we live in because uh, well, because we live in an age where regulation and taxation and, and such is to the point that it really is a tyranny. And, and you, they, people have to have help to navigate it. Let me give you an example of, of one of the, the flops in this. His lawyer specialized in, he was a Christian guy, but he specialized in suing uh, car manufacturers on behalf of car dealerships. Probably not exactly what one would be looking for in terms of starting a business, right, and figuring out how to finance it, but that's what he did. His lawyer, he said, was a great Christian guy. 
They needed money. They were at points in this working basically around the clock to keep their computers cranking. They were copying VHS tapes themselves. They were trying to pay payrolls, trying to ship these tapes out, you know, trying to get this thing started. Here's what he says. Um, lawyer offers to help finance. He steps up and says he'd invest $50,000 in exchange for 25% of the company. He didn't have it, but a friend of his did. So the friend would put it up and they'd each own 12.5% of the company. So he's going to take an investor on it. Phil Vischer says, I was a little concerned by the fact that his friend wasn't a Christian, but my lawyer assured me he would be a silent partner. Now, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18 talks about not being um, uh, unequally yoked. Uh, I won't bore you with my whole talk on that and my proofs for why I think that involves not going into a business partnership with unbelievers. Uh, I will just say one little part of that. Paul in one point says, what partnership has light with darkness, that word he uses for partnership is the exact same word. It's, it's actually a relative of the word. The exact same word is never used in the New Testament. A you know, relative of that word is used to describe uh, Peter's partners in the fishing business. Sounds like to me it's a coach and business partnership, not just marriage. Uh, Phil Vischer was a little concerned about it, said it would be okay. Um, this guy causes all kinds of trouble. Eventually they decide to buy him out. We, he calls him by this point Mr. Not So Silent. We wrote him a check for $750,000 to buy back his 12.5% of the company. That price was established because Gable Entertainment offered to buy Big Idea. He says in just two, under two years, Mr. Silent has seen a $25,000 investment multiply 30-fold. Not bad. Look how costly that advice was. That method of finding financing in just a few years cost literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. The other thing that really killed Big Idea uh, was the fact that the growth, he was not able to manage the growth. It basically grew out of control. Um, and that a lot of times is a curse on a company. Uh, it, companies grow too fast and then companies die because they have bad ideas and they can't make sales. And that's of course true. Some of them are lousy ideas and they go out of business, right? Um, but many, many companies don't go out of business because they can't get sales. They go out of business because they grow so fast to get too many sales and they don't know how to handle it. That's what happened with Big Idea. The story about what oh, is this? You grew up with Big Idea, right? What does, it, what, what does Bob say at the well after the presentation, but before the very end? Walks over to computer. That's close. We're over here by QWERTY to talk about what we learned today. And then what? <laughs> so, so at, the, at the end of this book, he's got a great session section on lessons, and he talks about what he learned from the ordeal. Um, lots of things sort of go into that. I guess I'm going to say a couple other things with that. At one point, VeggieTales were, were going to be put on the shelves of Walmart. At that point, Walmart said they're too Christian, and you're going to offend them. Now Walmart has a Christian book section, right? So it's, they became convinced we can make money. Apparently it won't offend people. But uh, they said it's a little too Christian. Can you tone it down a little bit? Phil Fisher, at that point, owner and control of the company, says, no, we won't tone it down. You know, that's part of what we do. Uh, after the company was sold in bankruptcy, uh, NBC offers to put VeggieTales on TV. Uh, they want it toned down a little bit. What happened? It's not in control of you. Think classic media is fine to tone it down a little bit to get it on NBC? Yeah, they are. So they remove, for instance, what Bob says, what they say at the very end of the show. The very end of the show is, God made you special. He loves you very much. That's what you say at the end of the show. Apparently, there are so many people in America and NBC's viewership who would be so deeply offended by being told that God made their kids special and loves them very much that we have to edit that out. Phil Fisher's unable to stop that because he doesn't own the country. So, I mean, it has a big impact. Uh, really, his dream was whisked away at that point. Um, so he, he's talking about, in, in this lesson section, he describes what it was like to lose the dream. There's some great stuff in that. He says one of the things you, you do First, when something like that happens, he says, when you skin your knee or bump your head, the first thing you need to do is roll around on the sidewalk, moan for a bit, clutching at the part that hurts. He said, that's what I did at first. I rolled around on the sidewalk, moaning, clutching at my heart. After I got tired of moaning and rolling around, I got up, looked at my smashed up bike or company, and started asking, how did that happen? Good, good tip. So he comes up with some different things. The first one he says is the one I need to get the book of this one. 
last one. Here's the first one. He says the thing, the number one thing you learn. This ought to be music to counselors. Never lose sight of the numbers. Never lose sight of the numbers. He says financial resources are like teeth. Ignore them and they'll go away. <laughs> Which is funny. Um, but he goes on to talk about um, why he actually thinks Veggie Tales fail. And uh, when he talks about that, he talks about his, which, which is his sort of his idol, who he wanted to be, which was Walt Disney. Walt Disney, obviously a creative genius, failed several times. He was on a train uh, from, I think, New York to LA when he, after his most recent failure, uh, when he drew a mouse that he originally called Mortimer. And his wife said Mortimer was not a good name for the mouse. Nobody would like that. So the name switched to Mickey. The rest is history, right? That was fine, the idea that stuck and uh, made Walt Disney enormously rich. Of course, he built Walt Disneyland with that. Walt Disneyland got too crowded um, by, uh, by kind of shops and stuff. Kind of like Gatlin Burke, how the fact that he grew up where he did. Everybody went to Gatlin Burke and so he did all these kind of shops, you know, the surround things. So he didn't like that. They start looking for somewhere else to go. They decide to buy a bunch of swamp land in the middle of Florida, which they do actually very similarly. Um, they uh, knew if they tried to go in and buy all the land around what would happen to the price of land. Go through the roof, right? If everybody finds out Walt Disney is buying land in Central Florida, the price of land goes through the roof. So they formed a whole bunch of companies that had names like Ginsid and stuff like that. And they separately and secretly brought the land in a bunch of transactions and then through a bunch of mergers and stuff, pulled that all back into Walt Disney. Um, is that uh, naughty? I'll leave that up for you to decide. <laughs> you can go to law school and think about stuff like that more. Um, but regardless, the, when they started building, when they started building Disney World in Florida, it was the biggest private construction pro project ever undertaken in the history of the world. Pretty impressive, right? Um, and uh, you think Walt Disney was such a creative genius? How in the world did he come up? How in the world did he come up with the money? You know, let me just think about the things that go into that. The short answer is he didn't. Uh, his brother Roy did. The Disney you've never heard of, right? But Roy was just as critical to the success of Walt Disney Company as Walt was. Walt was the creative genius. Roy was a genius of a different kind. I mean, he's a genius that a planning attorney like me or an accountant like you could appreciate. Um, he was a genius with numbers. He was a genius with lining up finances. Um, he's the one who made all that happen. Supposedly, Walt Disney passed away when he, he passed I didn't see it, but I'm, I'm not sure it's true. He passed away right before Disney, Disney World opened in Florida. Walter Cronkite was there at the opening. He interviewed his wife. Um, he asked her some effect of, what would you think if, if Walt could see this now? Her answer was, if Walt hadn't have seen this, none of us would be seeing it. You know, so the idea is if Walt hadn't have come up with this, similarly, if Roy hadn't been able to see it in a different way, we, none of us would ever see it because he's the one who put together the money and financing. The other thing that Roy provided was he provided a real check on Walt. Uh, Walt trusted Roy. He loved Roy. They had, they had a, 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 the type of relationship where Roy could tell Walt no and Walt could trust him that it wasn't some ulterior motive or something going on. He cared about him, he cared about the company, he wanted to be able to help, you know, he could tell him no and he could trust it. Um, they, of course, get into it occasionally, but they, they, had, they had a really an amazing relationship that brought that about. Phil Fisher ends up concluding the primary reason that, that Big Idea failed the way it did is he never found his role. I would suggest to you that that is a very important way that you can glorify God as an accountant, as a, certainly as an attorney, a planning lawyer, is you can be a Roy to somebody. If you're, if you're like, I mean, I don't know, you may be very, very creative. Lots of people I went to school with in, in county school, you know, this might be the extent of the art, right? I mean, we weren't particularly creative people necessarily, you know, we weren't, you know, it, 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 creative in a different way, though. And, and, and what you can do is really help people, really invest in their lives. And I, I had clients who were like that, who grew to trust me so deeply that I had them call me, and I'm years out of practice, because they had a personal problem they wanted to talk to me about. Uh, you know, certainly you can, you know, we talk a lot about evangelism, and well, we should, you know, you, you probably ought to know how to explain to somebody how to be saved, something like that, right? If you don't, that'd be a good thing. 
to do. But honestly, the most, and I and I did some of that in my practice, but probably the most powerful evangelism I ever did in my practice was business clients that I represented for years and years who I could serve sort of as a roy to them to help them shepherd and steward the dreams, gifts, and opportunities that God had given to them. They would see me day in and day out. I would talk to many of them once a week or more. And over the years, I, I was really, I, you know, they were able to sort of see me living out the Christian walk in a way that it made a deep impact on them. And it is a really privileged opportunity to serve in them. It's a really neat way to glorify God if God's given you. And it is creative in a sense. It takes creativity to say, how are we going to come up with $50,000 in a way that's not going to destroy the company in two years or contribute to its destruction, right? How, how are we going to grow here? Uh, can I be a person that you trust enough for me to say, well, I'm not sure this is going to work? What are you playing on here? How are you going to pay for that? You see what I'm saying? A really, really important role in law school gives you, I think, a great chance to hone your skills to be able to that. One of the best things that I had in my practice is something that we, we train people to do over there. And so that's a pitch of why you got to go to law school with some heart. It's a great opportunity to glorify God with the gifts, talents, and abilities that He's given you. Why don't you go to Liberty's Law School in particular? I'm going to pitch that just a bit. Obviously, I'm biased toward Liberty. Uh, you may not have known it, but in the RDC rankings, Liberty University is the number one law school in the country. Uh, the second one is the University of Kentucky. RDC is my initials. So, remember Rodney Dale Christman rankings. Yeah. Um, but Liberty is the number one law school in the country, and that UK is second. Why UK? Because I went to UK. Um, so, uh, UK is the second best school. It's a distant second behind Liberty. Um, uh, we got a bunch of stuff up here you can pick up. Mr. Kessler, you one of our uh, commissions counselors, would be glad to talk with you in the back if you have questions. Um, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna pitch to you a bit about what Liberty does that no law school in the country does. Uh, the first one is that we are, that our mission, it is our Christian mission is pervasive in all that we do. Um, we don't just, we don't just pray at the beginning of class and then teach class like we would at any other law school in the country. Um, we really do endeavor to understand the law, all of the law from the Christian worldview. So that means things like. Um, well, certainly like what I just told you about what the role of an, of an attorney would be in a business planning situation. It means things like we consider what is the proper role in regulating the financial system. You know, securities are I'm teaching that right now. Um, is limited liability uh, a good thing from a Christian worldview and how can it be used properly? We're talking about planning law. Um, you get the idea, we really try to deeply consider those things because we believe the Bible is you know, God's word for all of life. So we're pervasively religious in a way I believe that no law school in the country is. Um, the other thing we have that, that sets us apart is the fact that we have a lawyering skills program that really does endeavor to prepare you to practice law. Um, most law schools are entirely theoretical and you learn how to practice law somewhere else. So the idea is we'll teach you to think like a lawyer and then you go somewhere else to learn how to actually be a lawyer. Um, we try to do both. Obviously we're gonna teach you to think like a lawyer we also want to think, teach you how to really practice law. So if you come to our law school, you will, um, you'll draft documents to form a small business. If you go all the way through and take securities reg and business planning, kind of the whole business track, um, you'll draft documents to do a reg D offering. It's a way to raise money for a small business like that. Um, uh, so you, you'll really walk that stuff all the way through. You'll be really prepared to practice law. Uh, in a way that I don't think you will at any other law school in the country. Uh, so, and I end it then with any questions. you have any questions for me about law school in general, Liberty in particular? How do you prep for the bar with an accounting background? How do you, how do you prepare for that? Because I feel like it's almost separate and you have to do it on your own time. Yeah, well, we do have classes to try to help you prepare for the bar. Um, I, frankly, almost everybody in law school takes a bar review course. Probably like virtually everybody takes a CPA exam, takes a, takes a course to prepare you for it, a review course to prepare you for it. Um, I wouldn't recommend not taking a bar prep course. Everybody does that. Uh, we do have courses that prepare you for that. And unfortunately, um, the bar diverges a bit sometimes from what 
you really do in practice. So there's always this balance of how do you, you know, how do you prepare students to practice while also preparing them to take the bar. So we're trying, you know, to, to figure that out always. But uh, you, the, the short is, you'll take a bar review course after law school. Everybody does the same way. Probably if any of you planning on um, taking the CPA exam. That on your own. Maybe you will. But. <laughs> actually, the CPA exam is harder. It's actually harder to pass than the bar exam. The pass rate on the CPA exam is far worse than the bar exam. So, that's over there going. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think what was the CPA exam? That's like the eighteen percent first time paper pass rate. Yeah, it's what's the pass rate on the bar right now? It. That's a complicated question. Uh, it varies. It's probably about in the 70s. First time, sure. First time, yeah. Yeah, you really, I don't know what the second one takers are the third time. We don't, I would say the vast majority of people, most people at most law schools pass on the second or third time. There are some schools that have 40% pass rates on the first time, and they have people who, lots of people who basically never pass the bar. Um, uh, you know, that that's a balance, too. We could admit fewer students with higher scores and flunk more than them out along the way have a much higher bar passage rate. Um, so in some sense, we, we want to give people a chance and we'll think, well, if God has really called you to be a lawyer and you really work hard at it and, you know, you, you follow the method we're going to give you, you'll probably pass the bar. If you don't, you, you can try again and you'll hope, you know, you'll hope pass it on the second time. But if you're looking at sheer percentage, you got a much better chance of going to law school and passing the bar than you're passing the CPA exam. You probably going to fail the CPA exam. I can tell you you're almost for sure going to pass the bar exam. You're going to have something to call that? Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, actually, the CPAs have done a fantastic job. And obviously, I got an undergrad degree in accounting. Uh, Tim Todd was a professor was a student of mine in undergrad because I taught here in undergrad first before I moved to law school. He then got his CPA, came, he teaches at the law school, and then he got a law degree at Liberty, he's my student there too, and he teaches there. Um, now, I'm a good friend of mine, I'm not an enemy of accountants uh, um, or CPAs at all, but account, uh, CPAs have done a fantastic job of marketing themselves. Um, uh, what the CPA license allows you to do is what? What can't you do without being a licensed CPA? Like, I can't practice law without being a licensed lawyer, right? What is it you can't do? Is it do tax returns? Can you do tax returns if you're not a CPA? Yes. Yeah. yeah, you can. In fact, it's, it's kind of the practice of law. <laughs> tax is law, right? So you can, you can do that without without loss. I mean, I, I, I did tax returns. Can you do um, can you do payroll for somebody? Yes. Yeah, so you can write paychecks and do that. Um, can you... Uh, Let's see, help somebody do uh, value their company. That means yeah. Oh, they're looking at the professor. That's good. The answer is yes, you can do that. Can you um, audit somebody's financial statements and issue a. No, you can't do that. That's the thing it allows you to do. Being a CPA allows you to audit financial statements and issue um, issue opinions on that, right? Like you just issue opinions and compliance with general accepted becoming principles, right? And that stuff. That's what it allows you to do. Think how brilliantly though they market in themselves. It's great. I mean it's it's fantastic. I mean they market themselves where a lot of people think you you know you can't you have to get your taxes prepared by CPA or you know you can't do bookkeeping if you're not a CPA. That's a good job of marketing. <laughs> it is. I, I think CPAs are enormously respected. Um, that's been tarnished a bit by Enron and some of the schools. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember my auditing professor, the guy I told you that I, I told him that almost persuaded me to be an accountant. He'd been a partner at Arthur Anderson. Now, when, yeah, I know, see, that brings laughter from you all, but now, when I was in accounting school, that was it. There was no better firm to work for than Arthur Anderson. I mean, they were the absolute gold standard. And I remember him telling me, you know, I think I can get you in. Uh, I can get you in at Arthur Anderson. I can get you a job there if you if you want to do that. You know, it's just so it's an absolute gold standard. I remember him telling us though in auditing class. He said, right now we have the privilege talking about accounting of being a self-regulating profession largely. Um, we largely get to regulate ourselves. He said, if we don't do a good job in auditing, if we don't take care of business there, 
there are going to be big scandals that will break out and, and we will lose our ability to be a self-regulating profession. It's amazing how prophetic he's been in that. I mean, he's a fantastic professor. He's been almost exactly right, right? Because then you got the, I always forget how the acronym works out, but the public, yeah, you got, right, you got the Sarbanes-Oxley and you got the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, right? You know, so so it's it's and there's been Supreme Court opinions on that and everything about there. But but obviously there's been a huge move by the SEC, the federal government, and others to take away the self-regulatory ability of accounting professions. So, yeah, that was a long answer. Give time. Right. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So what skills? talk about it briefly, but mm -hmm. what skills do you think you learn in the accounting program that are specifically for once you get to law school? I think a whole, a lot of law school is, a, a whole lot of law school, I would say there's two pieces in law school. One, that can make you successful in law school. Um, one is the type of thinker you are. You, you have to be a systematic, disciplined thinker. And the accounting degree really, really helps for that. Now, it doesn't hardly help as much in, say, tort law, which is tort, is, we got a business law, I guess. Torts mm -hmm. is French for wrong, so that's personal injury law, that type of stuff we think about. It doesn't help as much in that, because I think that's a little bit less systematic. I'll tell you what would really help for that, though. Read the first five, the first five books of the Bible. If you read those books carefully, you'll be astounded how much tort law you'll know. I've never read the Bible all the way through. I was raised in a Christian home. I became an atheist. Um, uh, when my wife met me, I was probably something like an agnostic. Um, uh, God really used seeing the ultrasound of our first child and started to really kind of crack my heart on that and save me. Um, of course, I told you my first baby was born in law school. So I, I, I started reading the Bible systematically all the way through as a third-year law student. I drove my little Toyota truck to the law school early, and I had to get a little Bible and sit and read a few chapters before I went in and started my law school day. Um, as I started doing that, and I already had torts as a first year class, I read through that, and I thought, what? We were telling my wife, if I just read the Bible prior to taking torts, I'd have done a lot better. And torts was the worst grade I ever got in my life. I don't know. And, and I, I deserved a, I originally deserved a much worse grade. But in law school, you're actually competing against everybody else in the class. That's kind of how it works for grades. Um, so the collective ignorance of the class buoyed me up and made my grade higher than I deserved. But it was still the worst grade I'd ever gotten. So one is to be a careful, systematic thinker. That really, really helps you in contracts, stuff like that. But then when you get into your second year and you start taking business associations and income tax, the ability to think, and even con law and some of the other topics, you wouldn't believe it, it's in. The, the ability to systematically think carefully through stuff, and I think accounting really helps with that. The other thing I help, I think, is the rigor of accounting. Um, accounting is a rigorous undergrad degree. I think it is here. I think it is at most places. You get used to working hard. You get used to, you know, having to read a lot, deal with complex topics, do a whole bunch of problems, you know, stuff like that, and you get that. Some of the other things, then, is lots of law deals with business and financial relationships because it takes money. To sue and be sued typically and so you know that's kind of a third one that just relates to I think it gives you a background in things that help that make a lot make a lot of the cases and stuff make sense because it's not it's not so lost on you even take torts and talk about products liability we're talking about the supply chain and how the liability runs up the supply chain well that idea can be really foreign to a history major and it's not foreign at all to any kind of major. so it's probably big ones I think and it's I, again, I'm very, very, I got good advice to get an accounting degree. It's a very good major to go to law school. If it's a good major to then even, act, you know, in practicing law, um, I, I use my accounting degree to develop business, to get businesses as clients. Because it gave me these skills. Advanced business law for accountants, and then um, uh, tax research and tax 
<laughs> I had your video on a graduate student in the MSA, so I oh, okay. had videos there. So oh, you had some videos of me, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you forget about those, and then, uh, I don't know, so I uh, hopefully that's good. <laughs> okay, good. It's kind of like being on YouTube, you know, you think, I don't know, is it yeah. good or not? But, yeah, it, 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 okay, yeah, that's good. See, I guess the videos are still in the Banks Business Law for Accountants. Yeah, I, I teach my own fairly good program. Any more questions? All right, thank you all so much for. Uh,